Release the hound. <laughs> Just want to watch the world burn. You are listening to The Hounds of Diana, and I'm your host, Harrison Katz. You all read the title Project Alberto Discrediting the Protestant Reformation. But before we get to the information, let's first turn to some scriptures. Reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, verses 15 through 16. Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns, or figs of thistles? Now, if you haven't already, I suggest you first watch Hound of Diana episode 48, discussing Eric John Phelps. And as an update, as of now, I have had no reply by email, and there has been no reply by Eric John Phelps on his own radio show. His own radio show, which will shortly be coming to an end. So, in the timing of all this, I decided I'm going to put out what I have on this topic. Seeing how I've been looking at it for the last several months now, and I've gathered some very interesting information, and I would like to share it with you all tonight. Now, understand, silence is consent. And this is, of course, something that Eric John Phillips has been teaching and preaching about for years, and so for him to refuse to even answer my charges against him regarding the information in which he teaches is an acquiescence on his behalf. He has forfeited. So, seeing how he has sought to resign his position as a broadcaster, uh, understand that the vast majority of his quote ministry is internet based. So if he is no longer preaching, then that is effectively the end of his ministry. Though he may have a maybe a handful of people who show up on Sunday service, including his family. So having said that, tonight we will be going into the history behind Two men. Two men who have a lot more in common than many of you may think. These two men I am referring to, of course, being Alberto Rivera and Eric Phelps. Now understand, me being a former associate of Eric John Phelps, the information I'm going to be sharing with you tonight, I have in a certain affinity with because this will be information shared from people who were dealing personally with Alberto Rivera. So I want to go through some of this information on Alberto and as we go through it share by way of comparing and contrasting the two men in order to see the vast similarities and patterns that arise. So the first document we're going to be reading this evening is by a man by the name of Roy Livesey, last name spelled L-I-V-E-S-E-Y, and he is a former associate of the late Alberto Rivera. And this document is entitled, Drawing Aside the Purple Curtain, The Alberto Rivera Story, Facts and Fantasy Compared, 40 Years of Fraud, by Roy Livesey. These were men that had personal dealings with both Alberto Rivera and his ministry. Introduction by Sean Wilcock. Alberto Rivera is a principal character in the, quote, Alberto series of picture books published by Jack Chick Publications in California. They claim to be based upon the life story of a man who said he was an ex-Jesuit priest converted to Christ. 
and on other information about Roman Catholicism and the Jesuits which he supplied. When asked to make a statement concerning the validity of his supposed life story, Vera published a declaration that was written by the, quote, JTC, which Jack T. Chick, was a, quote, true and actual account. But this was a lie. And although this lie was exposed to some extent by others before him, Roy Livesey carried out the most extensive and thorough research of all into the life and claims of Alberto Rivera. His research revealed that Rivera was never a Jesuit priest, but a fraud and a deceiver. Sadly, although Rivera died in 1997, his false message continues to be promoted across the world via the Chick comic books as well as via the many who believed him and continued to do so. Now I want to pause here. Let me state before I continue. As we'll, we will read later on in these sets of articles, he is not dismissing the evidence and the history of the sins and evils of Romanism and the Vatican and the Jesuits in the past. He is not refuting that. He is refuting the personal claims that, have, that can not be substantiated by any other source outside of what Alberto Rivera claimed he learned secretly in the Vatican. And secondly, and most important, outlining his unchristian behavior, his downright theft and downright immorality involving his relationships and behavior toward other members in his own church. Now, continuing. Sadly, although Rivera died in 1997, his false message continues to be promoted across the world via the Chick comic books as well as, as, well as via the many who believed him and continue to do so. And those who seek to expose him are branded, quote, Jesuit agents or Vatican stooges, the very tactic which Rivera used and one which the gullible are only too willing to emulate. As Livesey writes in the pre preface to his short biography entitled Alberto Rivera, quote, Alberto Comic Book Con Man, published in 2005, quote, Shirley Rivera must have been the most consistently successful deceiver the church has known. After some 40 years of deceiving readers and international audiences, Rivera died in 1997 without ever having been stopped in his tracks. Unfortunately, there have been too many undiscerning Protestants and evangelicals ready to be persuaded by our con man and agent provocateur. Alberto Rivera could only exaggerate and hinder the truth. The truth is essential if God is to be honored and the Protestant cause not hindered. It must be borne in mind that Roy Livesey exposes Rivera's fantasies in the article below, but this by no means to say that many of the things Rivera described have not indeed occurred, or that they are not occurring still. Rivera said many true things about Rome, gleaned from very various reliable sources, or he would not have been able to deceive so many for so long. But Livesey's purpose is to show that Rivera was never a Jesuit priest, and that he fabricated many things about Rome to sensationalize his life story. But Livesey's purpose is to show that Rivera was never a Jesuit priest, and that he fabricated many things about Rome to sensationalize his, quote, life story. Also, it must be pointed out that some of those who have written exposés of Rivera in the past, and the publications in which these have appeared are not doctrinally sound and we do not recommend them for doctrine in any way. But men carry out good factual research regardless of their personal beliefs. Rivera branded all such researchers as Jesuit agents, and sadly many who continue to believe his message follow him in this tactic. But it does not automatically follow that every man who has exposed Rivera is an agent of Rome whose research is faulty. Evidence is evidence, and shooting the messenger, just because his message is not to their liking, does not make the evidence disappear. Facts and fantasy compared, 40 years of fraud. The fantasy is of Rivera as a Jesuit priest, destroying Protestant churches and seminaries, and eventually 
made privy to extraordinary Roman Catholic history and Vatican secrets no historians have ever uncovered. The fact is, we discovered 40 years of Rivera's fable, test false testimony, and fraud. And now the timeline. 1942. The fantasy starts with Alberto, a seven-year-old in the Canary Islands of Spain, beginning his studies to be a priest. Millions of best-selling picture books have gone out from Chick Publications, Chino, California, telling his story. The fact is the, the, fact is the story is on 1949 to 1951. Rivera's fantasy includes homosexual interference with him by priests in, in his Jesuit school. Tales of tunnels connecting monasteries and convents, with places for disposing of bodies of babies. Rivera tells of one visit from his Jesuit school to the Salesian monastery working with orphans. His friend fell in a ditch, and the pictures from, quote, the forest relate more of the scurrilous story. Rivera has told some that he attended the Salesian school. According to this picture book, he attended the Jesuit school. Neither school has any trace of him, nor was there a Salesian monastery, only a school. The fact is, according to Rivera's elder sister, he never attended any kind of religious school. 1952 to 1955. Rivera was, according to his fantasy, destroying Protestant seminaries and churches in Spain. The photograph below shows the fact of a very youthful Rivera, Bible in hand, in the Canary Islands when a member of a Protestant church during this period. As to education, while most future Jesuit priests were getting an education, Rivera became a fair collector. Here we found his first frauds against the local bus company in Las Palmas. And there's a picture of young Rivera. 1955. Rivera went for further education to a seminary in Costa Rica. The fact is that he was sent by the Canary Islands Protestant Church. The photograph shows him about to leave by ship with another young church member, Plutarco Bonilla. Rivera's fantasy is that he was serving the Jesuits and he helped destroy the seminary. 1955 to 1957. One fantasy at the seminary is that two beautiful girls were assigned to him, as depicted in the comic book Alberto. Alongside, we show a portrait of Rivera in 1956. Another fantasy is that Rivera occasioned a hunger strike to serve Rome in bringing the seminary into disrepute. The fact is, according to Plutarco Bonilla, Rivera was involved with none of this. In 1957, Rivera was expelled for lying and for breaking seminary rules. 1957. Another fantasy is that Rivera was ordained as a Catholic priest in Costa Rica. The fact is, after Rivera was expelled from the Protestant seminary, he sought the sympathy of a Methodist church and began to work with them. A bad report from his Methodist superior is in hand also. 1965. Chick's picture book Fantasy finds Rivera in 1965 as a Jesuit priest in Guatemala exposing Rome to a crowd of 50,000. We see him arrested by the Roman Catholic authorities and eventually taken to Barcelona, Spain, to a Roman Catholic asylum for priests who have gone insane. The fact, Rivera was in Hoboken, New Jersey, El Paso, Texas, and Mexico. In Hoboken, he worked for the Christian Reformed Church. He had a wife, Lydia, and they had a, ch a child, Juan, of a few months old. This, this, this young boy was also known as Johnny. His supervisor tells us his work and behavior were unsatisfactory. He was dismissed from the church. He left debts unpaid. Rivera and Lydia traveled via El Paso into Mexico. A Christian minister's reports from, he, from there shows how Rivera was still exploiting people, Catholic or Protestant, in 1967. Another fantasy is of Rivera getting converted to Christ and miracul miraculously escaping from an iron lung in the insane asylum. The fact is, is that Rivera was working as the director of a Protestant school in the same Spanish city. He was soon dismissed, whereupon he went to the nearby Roman Catholic parish of San Lorenzo, complaining of persecution by the Protestants. 
He swindled the Protestants, and now he was swindling Catholics in a poor part of the city. Rivera also swindled a Roman Catholic school. Apart from the financial fraud, now living in a Catholic monastery, he also equipped himself with false Roman Catholic papers and attire. In his new robes, he returned on a money-raising visit to his native Canary Islands, telling the local newspaper he had been ordained as a Roman Catholic priest in Costa Rica. Neither converted to Protestantism nor converted to Roman Catholicism, in 1967 was in fact another year of financial swindles. Such are the facts. Alberta's true history has repeated itself. The extraordinary facts of 1967 are as remarkable as the fantasy of the picture books. Twisting the Facts Rivera's fantasy of a Vatican plot against him to his visit to a dentist, evidencing his normal paranoia, two pages of pictures in detail in Double Cross, which is the, the Chick publication, tell how the dentist purposefully left him open to infection and death. The fact is that the dental procedure Rivera describes are normal dental practice. The inside front cover in all the picture book displays Rivera printed credentials and we are invited to the wrong conclusions, just like the visit to the dentist. His Spanish ID card describes Rivera as a priest and he is wearing a Roman collar. The address is that of a Roman Catholic church in San Lorenzo, Barcelona, after his dismissal by the Protestant church. Rivera's priesthood is a fantasy. The fact is there was no formality to stop anyone describing himself as a priest or as anything else on an ID card in 1967. Yet another fantasy pictured on the inside cover is of Rivera supposedly as director of the parish school in San Lorenzo. The fact is, there was no parish school in San Lorenzo. Alberto's sister in London. In the same year, 1967, Rivera flies to London. He discovers his sister, Maria, in a convent there. His fantasy is that her dress was blood-soaked, dried, and stiff from bleeding ulcers on her back after flagellation. After the arrival of the Metropolitan Police, he carries his sister away to safety. Where is Maria today? In 1991, Rivera hadn't seen his family for many years, and we read in Double Cross, quote, Dr. Rivera believes she is either dead or suffering in another convent. A new picture book published in Korea in 1990 tells us that Maria was martyred by Roman Catholics. Such is the fantasy. Deluded members of Rivera's church wept real tears with him upon hearing his story of her death. Such is the tragedy. Yet the fact is that in 1991, Maria is alive. Rivera Wanted By 1968, supposedly now converted, Rivera is in Tennessee, no longer pretending as a Roman Catholic priest, but cheating a Protestant denomination and many good people who helped him. Soon he is swindling people in Florida, and we find him wanted by police there for theft of a credit card and an automobile from church people. Back with Lydia again, and with another infant, another infant, remember the baby Juan, baby Johnny? With another infant, Louis Marks, a few months old. We soon lose trace of Louis Marks. With car and credit card, Rivera and Lydia leave for Washington State, where Rivera preaches at revival meetings. The pastors in Seattle, Washington, got word from Florida that they had a fraud amongst them. A bank official, a bank official from the Barnett Bank in DeLand, Florida, and a lieutenant of DeLand Police Department were after him, but Rivera escaped them all. Names, titles, and degrees. Rivera uses the style of a bishop. It is probably a fantasy that he was ever a bishop in the old Roman Catholic Church, as the Alberto book tells us. Remember that, the old Roman Catholic Church. That's the whole pre-Vatican II sect of fundamentalist Catholics. The fact is there is a letter from the Archbishop of Archbishop and Metropolitan which states that Rivera most certainly has never been ordained into the old Roman Catholic Church. To academic matters, the fact is that Rivera is a man of poor education. Rivera's fantasy is that he holds doctorates in philosophy, theology, sociology, 
history, and the Bible. Rivera's birth certificate identifies his only names as Roberto Rivera Romero. That is the fact. Rivera's fantasy adds a new name, Magno. In English, it is translated as Magnificent. His printed card shows a coat of arms in Latin inscription and his name, Alberto Magno R. Rivera, DT, DD, ND, NRH, dash Bishop. Two different false stories. Rivera produced an account of his life on a Spanish photograph record from, titled From Rome to Christ. He deceives Hispanics across the American continent with it. The record is different from the picture book testimonies, yet both are false. Eventually, the 32-page picture book Jack Chick produced from 1970 to 1988 were abound with Rivera's fables. His so-called comic book are anything but comic. Powerfully persuasive, the Alberto series, like the picture books based upon John Todd before Rivera, and the stories from Rebecca Brown and, and Elaine since, contains much fantasy. Rivera is not who he says he is, yet sales and distribution are on a vast scale and millions of readers attracted by the powerful graphic sensationalism, neither visited, neither first in history nor detailed workings of Roman Catholicism, come to believe Rivera's fiction and falsehoods. Chick promotes new history. By 1988, because of the Chick picture books, Rivera is widely known in Christian circles throughout the world. His passports to ever more speaking engagements have been the Chick books. The later ones have progressively given less space to Rivera's personal story and more to the new history Rivera supposedly learned when given access as a Jesuit priest to the secret archives in the Vatican. It seems likely that among all the publications against Roman Catholicism, nothing has ever had a circulation as large as these picture books. I'm going to read that last sentence back to you. It seems likely that among all the publications ever against Roman Catholicism, nothing has ever had a circulation as large as these Alberto Rivera picture books. Now, this is getting to the point and why I titled this program Project Alberto Discrediting the Protestant Reformation. Because 100 to 150 years prior to this, in the early 1800s to mid-1800s, Matter of fact, throughout the whole 19th century, there were thousands, if not tens of thousands, of books written in all different languages from all these different countries exposing the power of the Roman Catholic Church and the Counter-Reformation Knights of the Jesuit Order. This was known history. And it's absolutely laughable to think that in this day and age, coming up to where we at least are in the reading here, in the late 80s, the most popular form of Protestant literature in circulation is a comic book filled with sensationalism. Do you get to understand where this is going? The bigger picture of what's going on here. Let's continue. The oppose Rome with startling examples of false history. We are told Roman Catholics were responsible for founding Islam. Such dangerous deceptions are also promoted through 22-page picture tracts. Chick publications with a range, which includes some good material, are almost certainly the largest Christian tract publishers in the world, claiming a production of 100,000 per day. One of their latest, quote, The Deceived, relates how Vatican spies were on the lookout for a potential leader of the new religion. The fantasy is that, at long last, they found a brilliant youth named Muhammad. The source of it all is Alberto Rivera, a man identified with 40 years of fraud. 1991, The Tightening of the Net 
This year sees a turning of the tide against Rivera. It is time for him to be stopped. The research into Rivera's life and background is substantially completed. There is material enough for several books and several films. On 21 August 1991, Carlos Oria, a former elder of Rivera's church, interviewed outside Los Angeles Municipal Court, was heard by millions on the main KABC TV news, quote, I discovered he's an imposter. He's a liar. He's in the church because money, end quote. Ismael Guerrero, a medical doctor and former elder who served Rivera for three years, gave evidence at Rivera's trial, that's these men sued Alberto Rivera in civil court, gave evidence at Rivera's trial and was also heard by the TV viewers. He said Rivera was, quote, getting a lot of Christians that are in a vulnerable state and he will draw money from you because you think you're helping this super cause, end quote. Now, does that not sound familiar? to people who have listened to Eric John Phelps for years? Isn't there always some kind of new super cause? Whether it's starting a bank, a private bank, remember that one, that just slipped away? I wonder how many people sent in money for that. Oh, how about the Bible school he was going to start? I wonder how many people sent him money for that. And that is, again, gone by the wayside. What about all the various court cases that Eric John Phelps has been supposedly involved in and wanted to raise money because it's going to be a big case to support his legal theories that he teaches in his private citizenship classes? There are many similarities, but let's continue. Carlos Aria and Donald Blanton, another former member, were the plaintiffs. The photographs were taken when Rivera conducted Donald Blanton's wedding. Ishmael Guerrero was best man. Three years later, the men were photographed outside the courtroom at Rivera's trial. The question before the court was, quote, money, a key in the Alberto Rivera story. The judge found against Rivera. He said Rivera hides behind high-sounding titles to take money from people who believe in his cause. And of course, Rivera got a judgment put against him that, of course, no one was able to collect on. And in this document, this man, Roy Livesey, provides pictures of the wedding and outside the courtroom. Conclusion. In a meeting with director of the KABC TV News after the program, Roy Livesey was told, quote, there is more than one story here, end quote. How right the director is. Rivera promotes the fantasies of his past exploits as a Jesuit. Yet the facts of his personal fraud, the mystery of his wife and children, the truth of the past 40 years is just as fantastic. Rivera's personal financial deceptions continue unabated. The false history is in the long term even more sinister and dangerous. As the TV news chief observed, there are several different stories in the Rivera saga. The research is done. Documentation is in hand. The script is complete. More than enough is available for a film and for a large book. Where other attempts to stop Rivera have failed, the church can pray that this time there may be success. There is, there is biblical warrant for Christians to act. Books and films are not the only way to stop Rivera. Some have observed that except he be locked up, there is no way at all to stop him. However, his extraordinary influence could be substantially curtailed by both a film and a book. Indeed, it is necessary to think in these terms if adequate warning is to be sounded, a warning to reach the millions who have been and will be misled. And that is the end of the reading of our first document. But there is more. There is much, much more. There is a part two to this 
same story, drawing aside the purple curtain. The truth about Alberto Rivera. Now this is done by Sean Wilcock, who gave the intro to the previous article. And this is entitled, Alberto Rivera, A False Brother. Alberto Rivera is known to many worldwide as, quote, an ex-Jesuit priest converted to Christ, end quote, particularly through the comic books that have been published by Czech publications, the most well-known being Alberto. Bible-based ministries, like many other ministries around the world, used to support his stand against Rome because he did reveal many true things about the Roman Catholic institution. However, as the years have gone by since Alberto was first published, evidence has mounted that Alberto Rivera's behavior is not that of a truly converted man. Those who know him personally, having even been members of his church at one time, have documented evidence of his sinful lifestyle, for which he refuses to repent. Whether or not he was ever a Jesuit is now irrelevant, as is the fact he has certainly revealed many true things about the Roman Catholic system. His conduct has brought reproach to the name of Christ. He has ill-treated many Christians and, quote, given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, end quote. In the light of this consistently sinful lifestyle, he cannot be accepted as a brother in Christ. While all true believers commit sin and have need for repentance, this is a different matter entirely to a man who walks in sin and has no remorse for it. A tape is now entitled, Alberto Rivera of False Brother by Sean Wilcock, which examines this matter biblically. And as a side note, that audio is on YouTube. I encourage anyone listening to go take a listen to that as a supplement to this information. Alberto Rivera preaches against the charismatic movement, and yet he has permitted charismatics to work for him. He believes Seventh-day Adventists are brethren. In a number of areas, he says one thing, yet does another. Many, many people who have sent him money for materials have never received their orders, nor their money back. This is theft. When men have parted from him because they cannot agree with him, he has labeled them infiltrators with absolutely no proof. And might I add, also calling them Jesuit agents of Rome. Does this sound like anybody else that we know. If you disagree with them, they're quick to cut you off, call it an attack and an ambush. Why don't you just come out and say it, Phelps? Don't you want to label me a Jesuit agent of Rome as well? But continuing, he has got men to loan him large amounts of money, promising to repay them, but has never done so. And I have a feeling that this would also be the same for Phelps. Though I have only ever donated to him, he has never asked me for a, quote, loan. But I could almost be positive that he's approached others for this very same thing. And doubtless, they never got paid either. His own church dismissed him from the pastorate due to his ungodly lifestyle and theft. Did any of you know that? That... The very same church that Alberto was a pastor of, his own church, that he was dismissed from his own church as pastor because of his ungodly lifestyle and theft. See, that's, that's a part of Alberto's story that many people don't even know about, as much of this is. Alberto is even claimed infallibility. All of the above information is documented. He has become a danger to the Church of Christ and must be exposed. Let it be categorically stated, unlike those who have said that Rivera's claims about Rome are false, we have no problem with the historical facts contained in his material. It did not take Alberto Rivera to reveal these things. The proof is found in many sources. The issue is not the historical facts. The issue is the ungodly conduct and false doctrine of the man himself. True believers should not support such a man, regardless of many true things he has said. Rather, they should pray 
of his salvation. And I feel the same way about Phelps. The history with Phelps is not necessarily his historical information. Though he is bound by certain parameters, which I believe he cannot go outside of, certain information he won't talk about. But nonetheless, the information that he does cover is vast, and his knowledge of that those portions of information are vast in themselves. But it is not his word that makes this history true. The history itself stands alone. Bible prophecy, which rightly calls out Rome as the whore of Babylon, the great, that stands alone by itself. One man, whether it be Alberto Rivera, whether it be Eric John Phelps, one man alone co-signing this history or teaching you this history does not make him the final word and authority on history. If you want to go down that direction, then you pretty much might as well enthrone him as a little mini Protestant Pope whose word is infallible. And anything he says goes. And one day he'll say this, but hey, next week he'll start pushing the goalpost back and it'll be something different. And don't ask any questions. <laughs> Definitely don't ask any questions. Continuing, Alberto Rivera, a con man, not a converted ex-Jesuit. Alberto Rivera, the man who claimed to be an ex-Jesuit priest converted to Jesus Christ and whose supposed life story was published as a series of comic books by Chick Publications, died in the United States in June this year, 1997. I was in the United States at this time. We heard the news from Roy Livesey, the British Christian author who has done extensive research into the life and claims of Rivera. Again, Roy Livesey is the one who wrote the timeline article that we read through first. According to one version, he, this is Alberto Rivera, died of food poisoning. According to another, he died of cancer. Apparently, and not at all surprising, Rivera himself claimed to have been poisoned, stating that the poison caused the cancer. Certainly his widow, Nuri, makes that claim in the first newsletter she published after his death. Donald Blanton, my friend and brother in Christ who lives in California, him and I visited Chick Publications in California to find out whatever details we could about Rivera's death. We were unable to meet with Jack Chick, I mean, big surprise there, but we spoke with Donna Eubanks, an ex-superior of a Roman Catholic convent and who now works at Chick Publications. As we suspected, Chick Publications appeared to prefer the food poisoning story. This would fit right in with all the other sensational claims Rivera made, including the many support, supposed attempts on his life by Jesuit agents. Donna Eubanks said that he had been poisoned, and yet, in describing the symptoms Rivera exhibited, it sound to us like cancer. Significantly, perhaps, Jack Chick himself made no mention of death by poisoning when he related the death to, of his friend, Alberto Rivera, in the Chick Publications magazine, Battle Cry. So even Jack Chick was hesitant to put that into print. I first heard of Alberto Rivera, like so many thousands of others, when way back in the early 1980s, I read the comic book published by Chick Publications. There are at present six in the series. The first is entitled Alberto, and the sequel, Double Cross, claimed to be based on the true story of a man who was a Roman Catholic Jesuit priest, an undercover agent of the Vatican who infiltrated Protestant churches, and who was eventually converted to Jesus Christ and left the Roman Catholic system, becoming a Christian minister. The other comics, entitled The Godfathers, The Force, Four Horsemen, and The Prophet, contain information about the supposed intrigues of the Vatican, which Rivera gave to Chick to publish. Some of the information is certainly historically accurate and has been documented in other sources, from which, no doubt, Rivera himself gleaned it. But there is also much in these comics which is utterly inaccurate, yet which we are supposed to believe merely on Rivera's say-so. Back in those days, I did not know this, and finding myself in a position to travel to the United States, I decided to do just that and to meet Alberto Rivera personally. I wrote to AIC Ministries, Rivera's outfit, in Upland, California, and received a positive response. 
I flew to Los Angeles in April 1985. I spent three weeks with Rivera and his co-workers, more so with his co-workers than with him. Why there, there were a few things which concerned me. I gave him the benefit of the doubt, believing, in general, that he was who he claimed to be. I was later invited by AIC, which is Alberto's Ministries, which stands for Antichrist Information Center. I was later invited by AIC Ministries to handle all their correspondence from Africa. I never joined AIC, but I agreed to do this for them. In this way, a great number of letters which African people had written to Rivera were passed on to me. And this was surely in the Lord's purpose. For in this way, many of them ceased dealing with him and began to deal directly with Bible-based ministries. In this way, things continued for a few years. All that we ever knew of Alberto Rivera, we knew from my brief visit and from his literature and tapes. And then in 1988-1989, the Lord began to expose the ungodly conduct of Rivera as never before. One of the men in Rivera's church was Donald Blanton. He had been corresponding. A series of events occurred, too detailed to get into here, which resulted in Donald leaving Rivera's church, and Rivera himself was excommunicated from his own church for this ungodly conduct. The details of these events are given in a lecture I delivered entitled, Alberto Rivera, a False Brother, which I mentioned earlier, and he goes into more details about how Alberto was actually kicked out of his own church. This is available from Donald Blanton, who is our distributor. In addition, he himself can provide further information about all these things. Rivera's conduct revealed that he was by no means a truly converted man, and he was not to be trusted. Sometime later, Roy Livesey from England, who had also initially been intrigued by the Alberto story, began to extensively research the history of Alberto Rivera, visiting the Canary Islands where Alberto grew up, the United States, etc. And what he discovered proved conclusively that not only was Alberto Rivera not a true Christian, but in addition, he had never been a Jesuit priest either. Roy Livesey uncovered a life of deceit and fraud going back decades. He has written a detailed book exposing Rivera, but yet has been able to find a publisher. Livesey did, however, write a booklet entitled Alberto Comic Book Con Man, which was published by Bury House Christian Books in Kidderminster and out of the UK in 05. The Alberto comic books are not to be trusted as reliable sources of information about the Roman Catholic system, nor are they the true story of Alberto Rivera. The true story of Alberto Rivera is that of an extremely clever con man. He has fooled many, and his story will continue to do so even though he is dead. Some have very foolishly said that any expose of Rivera will only be playing into the Vatican hands. This is absolute nonsense. The fact that the Roman Catholic institution is the great horror of Bible prophecy does not stand or fall with Alberto Rivera. Amen. Yes, Alberto was a fraud. He was never a Jesuit priest. But this does not in any way alter the truth that the Jesuits are the most diabolical organization to ever disgrace the face of the earth. There is ample evidence of this, the evidence of centuries of history. And they are just as diabolical today, for which again there is ample evidence. Alberto was a fraud. But let none think that the Jesuits are not a danger to the world and to true Christians, merely because one man was found to have concocted a fanciful story. We will readily direct any interested readers to some of the literature above available on the Jesuit order. It is horrifying. They most certainly do infiltrate churches, that's the Jesuits, and seek to destroy biblical Christianity, to overthrow governments, etc., etc., the truth is, we do not have to resort to Rivera's fanciful tales. The real history of the Jesuit order is terrible enough. 
Meanwhile, their Alberto ministry continues. It is now in the hands of his wife, Nuri, and their son, Albert, and it is based in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Rivera's work was called AIC, International Christian Ministries, and AIC standing for Antichrist Information Center. Interestingly, although it is still called AIC, the first issue of the newsletter published by his widow, Contending for the Faith, Volume 1, uh, issued September 97, states that it is now, now called Assurance in Christ and Alberto Ministries. On page 2 of the newsletter, Nuri Rivera, who is now the pastor of the church, right, this uh, Mrs. Rivera here, wrote that her husband, quote, was intentionally poisoned, unquote, claiming, quote, witnesses are everywhere, unquote. She declared that she would, in the next issue, quote, show the world what happened. Rivera himself was always making extravagant claims, stating that he had solid, quote, proof for this and that. No solid evidence of poisoning has ever yet been given, but there is solid evidence that Rivera was a fraud, a man who deliberately deceived millions, usually keeping just one step ahead of the law. Tragically, his story will continue to circulate throughout the world, and thus the deception will continue. We urge Christians to arm themselves with the true history of this man, and to do what they can to expose the false version which he so, sex so successfully promoted to the world. Okay, so you may ask, okay, Harrison, what if Alberto Rivera was a liar? What if he was a fraud as far as his personal background information? That does not in any way discredit true history, and I 100% agree with you. But what we need to understand as far as this connection with Phelps, we need to be looking at this timeline. So Rivera is either poisoned or, as others think, actually died of colon cancer in 1997. And remember, at that time, he is the most popular, outspoken, Protestant, quote-unquote, minister preaching against the evils of Romanism. He is literally the loudest man in the room. When he passes away in 1997, that mantle had to pass on to somebody. And I find it intriguing that the same man who seemed to pick up that mantle, being Eric John Phelps, came about just about three years after Alberto Rivera passed, when he published his first edition of Vatican Assassins Wounded in the House of My Friends, which he claims took him three years to write and get on paper. Now, my question is, where did he get the materials to write that book? Because anyone who's looked at it understand it is not a book in the classical sense of a non-fiction historical account. It is more like an encyclopedia, and it is filled far more with other people's words in which Eric John Phelps is quoting rather than his own original. So, the question is extremely valid to this point. Where, in a time before the internet, right, before extreme popularity of the internet, where all this information has now sub subsequently, in the years following, you can find much of this literature online, but not this early on. Where was he able to get all the quotes, all the pictures, from all the various sources? Well, if you think about Alberto Rivera's ministry, AIC, Antichrist Information Center, which he had been running for maybe, what, 20 years and then continued even after his death with his pastor wife, no doubt people who were interested in this information or maybe had a book or an article, just like much of you who maybe listen to Phelps and you want to help him, so you send him books, you send him articles about this very information trying to help because he's the, he's the one out there. He's the loudest voice out there talking about it, right? So give it to him and let him discuss it. Well, no doubt the same thing was happening to Alberto and his AIC ministries. So no doubt by 1997, he must have had quite the library of books exposing Romanism and the Jesuits. Now, where do I think all that material went? I think it went to Phelps. Remember, Phelps also 
himself admitted that he had an ex-Jesuit help him prepare his book. I contend. I put forth that it was actually Alberto Rivera, and it's very possible that Phelps had a personal relationship with Rivera before he passed. Now, why do I say that? Well, it's not just the fact that Phelps, shortly after Rivera's death, became the loudest man in the room, per se, as, as far as openly vocalizing uh, some kind of offense against Rome and the Jesuits. Eric John Phelps took up that mantle of Alberto Rivera. But shortly after his death, you see men like Roy Livesey, men like Sean Wilcock, on internet forum boards. And who are the def who are the arguing against online who is in fact defending Alberto Rivera at that time? Well, none other than Eric Phelps. And so let's read this, because this will be getting into a lot little more detail in what I'm talking about. This is a forum post which was a reply to Eric and others in regards to Alberto Rivera and this information, specifically what I was reading prior. A letter on Alberto Rivera, fraud or failure to act as a Christian. Editor's note, Alberto Rivera claimed to be a Jesuit priest, his story being published by Czech Publications, but the real story about him is written in this letter by a person who actually knew him personally and worked in his ministry. One final note, Alberto Rivera has passed away some years ago, also, more insight about his life contained in another little letter can be found here. And there's another link. Now, this is me reading this archived response in an email form to these people on these, these internet message boards regarding Alberto Rivera. Now, this is the, this is the letter. To Eric and others in this debate regarding Rivera. This letter is to address the person of Alberto Rivera, and more directly, why I, as one that worked with him, know that he was not only not a Christian, but also not a Catholic priest, Jesuit, or any other kind of Roman Catholic system, or anyone within the Roman Catholic system. My permission is granted to forward this email to anyone that is interested in knowing whether Rivera was really a Christian leader or a fraud posing as a converted Jesuit priest. I shall be very direct and blunt in this letter, and it is time to stop with the endless discussion of side issues that are ignoring the fact that Rivera was a wolf in sheep's clothing that appeared as a minister of righteousness and deceived many that had left Romanism or were trying to witness to Roman Catholics. It would be easy for me to write many pages of these things regarding Rivera, but I shall limit this to a ten major points. Most of the people who received this email have request or received my documentation on Rivera, so they are aware of Rivera's actions while professing to be a converted and his conduct as an elder pastor of a congregation. Just for the record, neither Eric, now mind you, this is Eric Phelps, neither Eric or anyone else that ordered the material has kept their word and paid for the cost of copying all the documentation and for the cost of postage. Now, to move on to the subject of the person of Alberto Rivera. Number one, no one defending Rivera has addressed the fact that Rivera did not know Latin. Now, this is a huge point. He was unable to read or write Latin and only knew certain phrases. In previous emails, I stated how, while I was under Rivera at the AIC, at his direction, I tried to get Robert Champagne, a former priest who whose testimony is in print, to join AIC so he could do Latin translation for the books that were being sent to AIC from around the world. Remember what I said about receiving all these books from all around the world? So they were looking to get this other Robert Champagne, who was a ex-Catholic priest and came out publicly, trying to get him to join AIC so that he could do the Latin translations. Why? Because Rivera not knowing Latin isn't something that can be dismissed. I was troubled by this fact and actually asked him about this at one time, 
and because I wanted to believe in him, I blindly accepted his excuse of problems with Latin being created by brain trauma from all the tormenting done to him by the Jesuits and from when he was in the supposed, supposedly in the iron lung. So yeah, from all the trauma, he forgot how to speak and, and read Latin. Number two. This following comment is for those who profess to hold doctrine of grace. Just how corrupt is one's personal life should be, and just how many false doctrines can a man preach before you see their fruit, they are still in the sins and in darkness. For anyone to know of Rivera's conduct of abusing his followers over many years and his false doctrines, either of them things in themselves are his true state and yet still view him as a Christian, show a lack of sound judgment and reveal a preconceived bias that prevents them from seeing Rivera in his true light. I know that people love the way Rivera spoke against Romanism, but his false doctrines and corrupt life cannot be overlooked or dismissed as just personal failings. Number three, the burden of proof is on the one making the claims that they have special training or education. The burden is not on those that reject his claim to prove a negative. If those who defend Rivera and put the bar so high before accepting information showing that Rivera was lying about his testimony would require even 50% of the same standard for those supporting Rivera, they would never accept him. Eric, you are wrong to say the burden is on Derek or myself to prove Rivera was a fraud. Those that support him should be willing to prove he is for real and be able to clearly show that the claims against him are false based on facts, not with personal attacks. Over and over, defenders of Rivera say that his accusers are attacking the man but not his message. Therefore, Rivera is real. In reality, many of those that have sought to expose Rivera, including myself, agree with much of what Rivera preached about Romanism. And I can say, personally, myself, I can say the same thing for Eric John Phelps. But we know the man to be a fraud. How do the defenders of Rivera normally react? They do what they accuse those of exposing Rivera do. They attack the people exposing Rivera. Sometimes those exposing Rivera with facts are in themselves unsound in doctrine, and they ignore the evidence they bring forth. I know this firsthand, and while at AIC I found it easy to dismiss evidence against Rivera because I didn't like the source that provided it. Sadly, I found out that many false professors in the ecumenical movement had done good research into Rivera's life story, but I dismissed it because they were not Christians. This continues to be the path of Rivera's supporters to this day. To defend Rivera, it should be done with real evidence, not by attacking those that are presenting the facts. Number four. Roy Livesey is not the issue, and who Roy is or isn't hasn't anything to do with whether Rivera is real or not. He did an excellent job of investigating Rivera's life, and hopefully someday his work will be made widely available. Once again, Eric, you have a tendency to make rash accusations which later prove to be false, just as you were quick to make rash comments about Sean Wilcock that you had to retract once you found out that he had written books exposing the Jesuit efforts in the ANC takeover of South Africa. But you have written to others and said that those that sued Rivera should have used the money to fund the publishing of Roy's book instead of paying a lawyer. To begin with, Roy didn't have a draft manuscript about Rivera back in May of 1990 at the time of the trial date. Additional reasons your judgments were faulty in this opinion. One, I would never have paid one cent to sue Rivera because I knew I would never collect when I won a judgment. And this is what happened. Number two, the sister-in-law of the other person in the lawsuit handled the case for us for free. Number three, it didn't take much legal work to prove Rivera to be a fraud and a liar. I only joined in on the lawsuit that Rivera's actions as a liar and a deceiver would be on public record. He's always challenged people to take him to court and pointed at the lack of convictions 
of proof that he was telling the truth and that others were liars. Uh, what, it wasn't just a few people deceived or left unpaid, as Eric seems to imply in one of his emails. To dismiss it as simple a matter of not paying off a few loans doesn't reflect what took place. We are talking much more than just not paying bills, lying, taking money under false pretenses, and not paying loans, which means he took advantage of people that trusted him and believed he was a man called of God. The medical doctor, the former deacon in Rivera's congregation, whom you told someone should have been able to finance Roy's book, had, quote, given and, quote, donated so much to Rivera and went in debt to borrow money, which is against his own house and his credit cards, at Rivera's request to put himself and his family in extreme debt that took him years after leaving AIC to recover. Now, at this time, let's talk about the bad financial dealings of Eric John Phelps. So, like I said, there's a pattern in this behavior. Many of the things that Eric has recommended over the years, and I thank God that I never actually, in, quote, invested or got involved with them, because they all turned out to be scams of some sort, which is why he would only promote them for so long, and then they would just disappear and never to be mentioned again. Three good examples. Number one. He was an early promoter of the OneCoin, that's OneCoin, cryptocurrency. And though it's far been, it's long since been scrubbed from his website, if you go back into, what is it, the Lebanon News that did the story on him, they mention it at that time, I think it's 2016, in that article, it mentions the OneCoin. Because at that time, he was actually promoting it on his website. And if you Listen to my prior Hounds of Diana episode where I discuss cryptocurrency. You will hear how I discuss OneCoin and how the former owner and CEO of OneCoin just recently made the FBI's top most wanted list, top 10 most wanted list, Ruja something or other. But go back in the archives and listen. And did you know that there was a one-time program on 24-7 World Radio where Eric John Phelps interviewed the CEO of OneCoin. Very intriguing. Example number two. Carrot bars. The so-called German holder of all this gold who was going to sell you gold by the gram. Cheap way of holding gold. Well, that recently went under. And not only that, but there have been huge questions into carrot bars. What were their actual holdings as far as what gold did they actually have on deposit? And again, one coin, carrot bars. These things are promoted. People who trust this man take his word, invest. They go under. And not so much as an apology from Eric John Phelps. It's just on to the next one. Until we get to the third example, which is the current the current money making scheme, which is Modere, which I'm sure is in a long list of multi level marketing, which Modere is no different. Um, got claims of products that again the, the bio cell within the Modere is nothing new. It was started, they were first putting it in juice before, and then the company switched hands, and now it's just putting a different product. And, of course, if you read the patent for the Modare BioCell, it somehow says that they can make the, the collagen molecule smaller so that it can pass through the gut cell wall, which, again, I mean, how, how they're able to shrink molecules, I, I, I don't understand. But again, you have these companies, multi-level marketing companies, things where you have to spend a certain amount of money per month in order just to qualify to get paid. And when you go to Modare's site and you try to understand, okay, I want to use this as a business opportunity, please tell me 
In simple terms, how do you make money doing Modare? Because it's not as straightforward as you might think. There are many examples of super projects being promised, always something going on in, you know, right around the corner. Um, the next big opportunity, you know, for, for people to, to make money. It's always something new. And when things fail and things don't go right, nothing is ever mentioned. No refund. No apology. No even, not even a public acknowledgement. Just radio silent. Number five. Roy Livesey, as to Roy Financial State, which Eric has talked about at length, based on his assumptions, it isn't something I know firsthand other than my experiences with him. But whatever his state is these days doesn't matter. Roy has many blind spots, but those that are so quick to throw out charges against Roy as if he was some secret agent of Rome and to those that are quick to believe these claims should find it odd that he provided a copy of his draft book to Alberto Rivera, Jack Chick, and Jonas Shepard. Roy has not found a publisher for his book on Rivera. Number six, if you listen to the tape I sent you entitled, If Alberto Rivera For Real, you will hear his rantings for yourself in some hysterical statements, not to mention his arrogance and lack of humility which is actually a three-part three part interview, which he did with a Lutheran minister, which is very revealing, which you can still find on, online on YouTube. Number seven, you can't biblically judge whether a man is saved or not based on his position regarding Alberto Rivera. One, and I would say the same thing about Phelps. One cannot show that Rivera's life revealed the marks of grace, and he is not a prophet or apostle for the scriptures, but may seem to hold him in such some seem to hold him in such high esteem. Charles Chinnickwe's book were of great value to me, especially fifty years in the Church of Rome, because it spoke to me as a former Roman Catholic as he struggled with what the scriptures taught and what he held as a Catholic. Now to Eric and others that blast away so quickly, making charges at men that don't agree with them. I don't see them holding Chinnickley to the same standard. In his book, Forty Years in the Church of Christ, he details a close relationship with members of Masonic Lodges. He was defended by them and preached at their temples. In my opinion, why it saddens me greatly that Chinnickley had any involvement with Freemasons, I believe in his ignorance he looked to the American Masons as the Protestant equivalent of the Roman Catholic Knights of Columbus. Number eight. There is much I know about Rivera that I have not discussed, but I didn't see a need to continue on and on over every detail. There should be enough in the documentation I sent out in both my tapes, which I have discussed and also read those two papers prior. Number nine. I remain open to questions about the material I've provided and experience with Rivera and those who were involved with the AIC during those years. Rivera did my baptis baptism after I left Romanism, and he is in all my wedding pictures and video. I idolized him and felt very privileged and probably ev even a sinful amount of pride that I was the right-hand man for a time for whom I thought was God's greatest servant since the Reformation in exposing Romanism. The heartache, heartache and pain I went through after realizing that I had been deceived and blinded by him was a time of great trial and weeping before the Lord. It was very humbling, but the Lord delivered me and I learned an important lesson about balance and preaching the whole counsel of God. Number 10. The Vatican is the mother of all harlots. The denominations and other false religions are her daughters, and the Jesuits are her most evil servants. This I know and preach along with the person of Christ and the duty of believers in seeking after holiness. This experience with Rivera taught me that there are many that will unite together against the Pope and his false religion, but there are few of them that unite in humbleness before Christ who hold sound doctrine and walk in light themselves. Now, of course, 
Alberto Rivera had some interesting acquaintances, to say the least. If you go online and you look up videos of Alberto Rivera, you will more than likely be seeing the videos of Alberto Rivera preaching at the Tony Alamo Christian Church. Now, for any of you who are not familiar with Tony Alamo or Tony Alamo, I will have a link in the description of this video to a lot of things I'm discussing tonight. But again, Albert Rivera was close with this guy, Tony Alamo, who in the mid-2000s, Tony Alamo and his Christian Foundation, uh, he was arrested in Arizona for violation of the Mann Act. And he took young girls out of state for sex from his compound in Arkansas. And this happened between 94 and 2005. Right? And he got sentenced to 175 years behind bars. And his ministry was ordered in 2014 to pay $525 million in actual and punitive damages to seven victims, which was the largest settlement in Arkansas history. So Alberto Rivera was hooked up with this, this man and his ministry. No doubt, I believe his wife, who was alive at the time, who well, as a side note, when his wife died, I believe her name was Edith, when she died, Tony kept her body preaching that she was going to rise from the dead. And then sometime after that, in I think the mid-80s, he lost his taxes of status. So there's a lot going on with these characters. And Tony Alamo, Alberto Rivera, they were tied in, bosom buddies. It gets even more interesting because after Alberto Rivera's death, in 1997, you've got Eric John Phelps publishing Vatican Assassins in the year 2000. Which again, I would say that the vast majority of that information that he received, he probably got from AIC Ministries. And probably knew Rivera himself. Maybe was given an early draft manuscript for what would become Vatican Assassins. All just speculation. But what I do find extremely interesting that is not speculation is the only witness, the only witness to ever come out and actually substantiate anything historically that Alberto Rivera claimed about his own past as a ex-Jesuit Roman Catholic priest was a man by the name of Gerard Buffard. This man claimed to be an ex-bishop out of Toronto and Guatemala. And wouldn't you know, him being the only man to back up Alberto Rivera's testimony of his own personal history, this ex-bishop is known personally by Eric John Phelps. And not only that, ex-bishop Gerard Brefard is interviewed by not only Eric John Phelps, but also Greg Szymanski. Szymanski and Phelps both interviewing Brefard to try to legitimate the claims of Alberto Rivera years later. And wouldn't you also know this is the same Szymanski who in, I think it's 2016, is talking about how the FBI agents were assigned to take down the ministry of Tony Alamo and jail him for 175 years because he was exposing the Vatican and not because he was being a predator to young girls. So, you've got all these characters who are all in these circles running together, verifying another's information, which really is, is not actual verification. It's an attempt to verify. You see, Gerard Buffard claimed that he was the one who signed Albert Rivero's literal death warrant. Not his certificate, but I guess you could say the contract to take Rivera's life. But not only did Buffard sign it, but he signed it with a special pen that has invisible ink. I mean, the claims just become ridiculous. And there you have Eric John Phelps biting hook, line, and sinker because this backs up his boy, Alberto Rivera, in whom whose mantle he took over. 
Okay? God, they have to upkeep the credibility of Rivera. Now, last point, and I'll leave it at this because this video is getting long enough. In dealing with Phelps and Phelps' book, specifically the first edition, I find it extremely interesting that Phelps is surrounded by all these New Age, Ashtar Command, Urantia believing, UFO cult people, specifically in his early days. For instance, Phelps' publisher of Vatican Assassins, Wounded in the House of My Friends, first edition, was published by a man by the name of Rick Martin, a.k.a. whose real name was Rick Courtright, and he was the general partner of Halcyon H-L-H-A-L-C-Y-O-N, Halcyon Unified Services, which is who published Eric Phelps' Vatican Assassins, but is also the same Rick Martin who is tied to Spectrum Magazine, which at the time, and you can still find, I've got a copy of Spectrum Magazine, I think it's the March 2000 edition, which you have Eric Phelps being interviewed by Rick Martin, and then in the middle of Eric's interview, you've got advertisement for like David Icke, his new book, um, them advertising for other New Age type material. So you've got that involved with his publisher. And then, of course, when he makes it to, uh, was it the second conspiracy con in 2001, he's introduced by none other than, quote, his good friend, end quote, Jordan Maxwell, who, again, is into this whole theosophy, Urantia, Ashtar Command, um, extraterrestrial administration of the universe. All right? This is what these people believe behind closed doors. So I will say this in closing, as far as Eric John Phelps and Alberto Rivera. If they didn't exist, they would have to invent them. Long live the king. Long live the king! But it's not a king. It's only a queen with a mustache. <laughs> Carl, you'd be surprised how many kings are only a queen with a mustache. But we all believe it's a king, don't we? Yes.